Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome this afternoon to the second of our Way Bay Days. Um, as I'm sure you all are aware, uh, these days accompany the exhibition Way Bay, which I curated with my two colleagues, Kathy Garretts, our film curator, and David Wilson, our engagement associate. And it was a great pleasure to work with them on this project that brings together art and film from our collections, also the Bancroft Library and the Hearst Museum of Anthropology, all related somehow to uh, the culture of the Bay Area over the past 200 years or so. Uh, so it was a wonderful um, exploration into really the depths of the collection. We unpacked a lot of things that hadn't been unpacked in many years. We also acquired a lot of new works. And uh, so for me personally and my colleagues, it was really a wonderful opportunity to discover some of the um, undeservingly hidden recesses of Bay Area culture. And part of our aim with the Way Bay Days is to shine a little bit of light on some of the really great artists uh, who um, maybe some of us don't know as much about as we ought to. And we've designed this in a way that it's, uh, any of you heard of this thing called pe Pecha Kucha, I think that's what it's called, where you get like five minutes to say something important. Well, we're gonna give people 15 minutes to say something important. So an inordinate amount of time um, excessive even, um, but I'm sure they're going to do a great job. So uh, I will mention also that uh, in addition to Kathy and David, I worked with John Shibata and Matt Coleman on the exhibition, and I want to thank Sherry Goodman, our Director of Education, for pulling this all together. So we have four uh, really wonderful and distinctive artists to talk about today, but also four wonderful and distinctive people to talk about them. Uh, so that's another treat today to have the, the presenters here as well who have come from near and far. Uh, in the order of their presentation, I'll introduce them all now and then they can just sort of come up one right after the other. Uh, Dina Beard will speak about Zarathustra. Uh, Dina is executive director of the lab in San Francisco uh, where she's done a wonderful job. I feel like that's all I have to say, but she's uh, organized exhibitions and projects with Doris Garcia, Ellen Fullman, Fritzia Irizar, Brontes Purnell, Lutz Bacher, Anna Halprin, Barry McGee, Silka Otto Knapp, and a pitch at Pong where Seth Cole. Some of those were here, actually, not at the lab. Uh, she was the curator here for how many years? Five years? Seven. Seven years. So uh, we lost her to, the, to San Francisco, and we're glad to have her back. Uh, she also teaches curatorial practice at CCA. Uh, she will be followed by Jeffrey Spahn, who will discuss Kay Sekimachi, who might be in the room. Uh, Jeffrey is a private art dealer specializing in 20th century masters of studio ceramics, especially Japanese, along with British and American ceramicists. He's written for Studio Potter Magazine, Ceramics Monthly, You Know Me, A Studio Pottery Collector's Guide, The Art of Toshiko Takeezu, among other publications. Uh, and I'm also very happy to say that Jeffrey is now a Berkeleyan. Uh, Steve Anker has flown in from LA, uh, and Steve will be familiar to many of you. He's uh, really a fixture of our community, uh, but he's come in today from Los Angeles uh, to introduce the work of Ann Severson Parker, Ann Parker Severson. Uh, he's currently the co-curator of film at Red Cat. He's curated film programs for the New York Museum of Modern Art, the London International Film Festival, the LA County Museum of Art, and also right here at BAM PFA. From 2002 to 2014, he was dean of the CalArts School of Film and Video and has taught at the San Francisco Art Institute, Bard College, San Francisco State University, and the Massachusetts College of Art. And then uh, fourth on our list, we have the wonderful Jeff Gunderson, who contributed to our Charles Howard Symposium last fall and is back to talk about Carlos Villa. Uh, Jeff has been the librarian and archivist at the San Francisco Art Institute's library since 1981 and for many years has played a very important role in conserving and appreciating the history of Bay Area art, about which I would hazard he may know more than anybody. Uh, he has contributed lead essays to the moment of seeing Minor White in the California School of Fine Arts and Black Power, Flower Power, photographs by Perkle Jones and Ruth Marion Baruch. So uh, before turning the mic over to Dina, I just want to uh, invite you to Way Bay Day number three, which will happen on Saturday, June 30th, and will complement the second iteration of Way Bay, which we're calling Way Bay Two, uh, which will have about 50% different works. So some of the works will remain, and uh, about 50% will be new. So that opens June 13th, so please come back for that. So Dina.
Thanks, Larry. It's always nice to be back at the Berkeley Art Museum. It's still my favorite museum in the Bay Area. Um, so I'm here to talk about Zarathustra, who I believe is here. Yay! Woohoo! So, Zara, um, I'm going to start out with these slides on screen from Zara's book, Friendship Between Artists. Um, and Zara will have them available for sale or to give away, depending on how, uh, how much you want to give back to the arts. <laughs> so keep that in mind as you look through these pictures. They're just a small, tiny capture of, um, that I took with my iPhone this morning on my kitchen table of this magnificent, gorgeous, glossy book. So have a look and see if you want to purchase that. It's pretty invaluable. So since the late 1990s, Zarathustra has bound together the twin spirits of resistance and community in San Francisco with an artistic practice that spans graffiti, screen printed posters, calendars, murals, paintings, videos, music, performance, parties, and protest. She started working during the first dot-com boom, painting in colorful, bold fonts that were legible across the major city streets of, the, of San Francisco. At that time, the boarded-up storefronts of the neighborhoods were layered with thousands of wheat-pasted flyers and stencils, marking time before they were torn down to make room for condos. Zara would often paint in broad daylight with paint rollers, writing out massive texts as long as a city block. Many of her pieces could be read, read from the freeway. As both performance art and painting, this, these pieces were absolutely stunning. Soon her slogans like no more prisons and stop wars became recognizable as rallying, rallying cries for both elder activists and younger artists. She was sending us a message. And to this day, when I see a piece by Zara, it is a sign that the city's heart is still beating. Zara has always looked for credibility and respect, not from the art world, but from working class people who have created safety and solidarity within their communities. As a result, his art provides many of the most powerful visual images of the Bay Area's anti-displacement and anti-war struggles of the past two decades. And her artistic collaborations have given essential support to organizations like the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition and the Coalition on Homelessness. As their work evolved over time from street art into elaborate performances and filmmaking, Zara has collaborated with countless others on the many now legendary art events like the anti-capitalist fashion show, the 949 market squat, and the band Manhater, while also contributing spec spectacular murals to Clarion Alley Mural Project and the Mission Neighborhood Health Center. When the art world has made overtures, Zara has used those opportunities at as a, as a what time to share space, time, and resources with others. Her exhibition openings become free community dinners, painting commissions become a chance to hire out-of-work friends, and the proceeds from art sales prevent the eviction, eviction of older queer elders. Like many of the artists grouped in with San Francisco's Mission School, if you don't look hard enough, Zara's work can be seen through a sugar-coated lens. Pretty horses, rainbows, a DIY scene of harmony discovered through, the, through beneficent collaboration. To the critics, I say, stop taking that Xanax and look harder because beneath every surface lies a battleground. From far away, Thustra's mural, this is what we're for and this is what we'll get, looks like it could belong in a, an amusement park. Painted for Bay Area Now at Yerba Buena Center for the Arts in 2002, the mural becomes jarring and urgent when you get up close. Horses are slashed through the middle, graphically bleeding. Two planes nosedive through two skyscrapers, illustrating an event that has had lacerating effect on America's collective consciousness in a matter that is still playing out today. The image of the two planes and the two towers played out over and over and over again in every screen in public and private space at that time. It was effectively burned onto our retinas. That image became the key to undoing three decades of activism, permitting the rise of national fascism through the distorted lens of what was considered to be foreign terrorism. As we are now discovering, optics can change culture for the bad as well as for the good, sometimes hastening the poisoning of the planet, the exploitation of our bodies, the paralysis of our minds. Dada was founded in 1916 at the Cabaret Voltaire in the neutral zone of Zurich, Switzerland. 
Hugo Ball initiated the first Dada as ceremonies with the recitation of nonsense poetry, sound poems chanted by a magical bishop in Cubist costumes. Dada started as an indictment of the bourgeois values responsible for the horrors of war and assumed many forms, including, including outrageous performances, festivals, readings, erotic art, nonsensical chance generated poetry, found objects, and political satire via photo montage. The Dadaists wanted to heal mankind by playing with artistic, intellectual, gender, and racial abstractions believing that anarchic expression could reclaim the irrational and magical facets of human life from a society gripped by the technologically obsessed vice of the Enlightenment. So I first saw Zarathustra's artwork via performance of Love Wars, a, co a collaborative performance project between Thustra and Shabana Lovelot. Love Wars performed for about a decade on stages big and small, including but not limited to drag shows, clubs, and bars, coffee shops, bookstores, art galleries, queer youth music festivals, the street, punk county fairs, the Museum of Trans History, and museums across the country. For me, Love Wars immediately called to mind the work of artist. Oh, I should probably show you a clip too. Before I get into it. In the shade, in the shade, in the shade, in the shade, in the shade area, we dance a little different. In the shade area, we dance a little different. In the shade area, we dance a little different. In the shade, in the shade, in the shade, in the shade, in the shade area, we dance a little different. In the shade area, we dance a little different. In the shade area, we dance a little different. In the shade area, we dance a little different. First saw, uh, for me, Love Wars immediately called to mind the work of artist Leonora Carrington. Her elaborate set designs recall her experiments in Cabaret Voltaire and translated over to her painting and writing practice. Like Thustra, Carrington's work has a fantastic quality. Bodies anthropomorphized between many states of being, and the surface quality of whimsy underlies a fierce undercurrent of darkness. This piece especially. Um, reminded me of Seastra's work. You can see the similarities. So, um, Zara came up to me, uh, I think it was 2015, and, t and I had just finished renovating the lab, um, which was pretty much squalid at the time, and we, we kind of removed all of these walls and the linoleum floors of the, of the building and kind of revealed the union hall structure that lied underneath. Um, we planted a camera in the top of the lab so you could see this kind of time lapse or video feed of everything that was happening in the space. So was, the idea is no matter if you're an audience member, a performer, somebody coming in to look at the space, generally you're always on view, you're in performance in the space. So you can see here Zara putting together this, their show at the lab, and uh, many, many hundreds of people who came. So quickly it comes down. Yeah. So um, for this first major art show at the newly renovated lab, Zarathustra created an installation filling the entire exhibition space. The display consisted of a decade's worth of art, from older pieces to brand new works. 
over several hundred in all. Highlights included Love Wars sets, a collaborative painting between um, Thustra and Zyler Jane, four major murals, <laughs> one brand new one, which hung in the theater, one, one that hung in the theater of YBCA for six years, which is now on view at the Berkeley Art Museum, which thankfully Berkeley Art Museum acquired, and the others that have been pr prominently displayed on Market Street in recent years. The largest measures nine by 64 feet, the collection also includes a small vending machine containing 40 mini paintings, sculptural works, photographs, prints, posters, paintings, fashion, and more, a comprehensive representation of the artist's range of skills. I think it's gone through the whole thing. So this uniquely, uniquely San Francisco experience opened on October 23rd, 2015 at 8 p.m. with a free dinner the stamps of Zara's Stop Men clothing line were worn by many attendees. She is a queer feminist icon, and over 400 people came out to see the project and participate. Performances took place throughout the evening, including a special collaborative performance by Saturn Jones and Thustra at 10 p.m., and performances by Shotwell and Plugged and many other artists. The event was dedicated to a powerful activist named Nana Kay. She was a longtime resident of the city and, and Attendees were encouraged to come out and show their love for Nana by placing tips at her queen's chair, enabling her re relocation to a new housing unit due to an impending eviction. So in this way, you can, you can see some of the collaborative ethos that has come together through two decades of Zara's work, and also how many people show up you know, and generate these works together. It was such an amazing event. So we can chat more at the Q&A afterwards, but thank you very much. <clears throat> Good afternoon. <clears throat> that was really fun. That was really great. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Spahn, and it is wonderful to be back on campus. Uh, I used to teach here 20 years ago, and I taught multicultural education. So um, as a longtime queer activist, that was a thrill. And one of my themes for my talk today on Kay Sekimachi is that Kay Sekimachi, who is 91 years old now, um, was cool... 70 years ago. And I just want to relate this talk a little bit because one of my specialties is contemporary ceramics and craft mediums that have risen to the level of contemporary fine arts. And what I don't want to talk about is technique. I want to put a disclaimer on my talk today. I am not an expert in textiles, so I'm not going to talk about card weaving versus twine split weaving. There are many experts that can talk to you about that. Um, what I want to talk about today is art and artists and the incredible artists that we have here in the, in the Bay Area. So thank you to Larry for inviting me to talk about Kei Sekimachi today. Um, I think how this invitation occurred is because um, Larry mentioned my husband and I just built a new home here in Berkeley. And most of our collection is contemporary ceramics, mostly American, British, and Japanese. But if you walk around in our house, pretty much the only other art that's in our house is all by Kei Sakamachi. So we own half a dozen pieces by Kei, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about what it's like to live with her work and why we live with her work and how powerful it is to be inspired by her art. I met Kay about 12 years ago, but I became aware of Kay when I was 16 years old. And Kay doesn't really know this, but when I was 16 years old, there was something called the selective service. And 
at the time, there was no draft or conflict in the United States. Um, but boys at the time were required to sign up for something called the Selective Service. It was sort of a pre-draft. And it made me very, very nervous. So I started reading. And I learned about what a conscientious objector was. And I was very interested in craft and ceramics. And I started reading about artists that were conscientious objectors, particularly people like Robert Turner and David Shainer, ceramic artists. And then I found an artist named Bob Stocksdale. For those of you that might be familiar, um, Bob Stocksdale was a wood turner, lived here in Berkeley and had the distinct pleasure of being Kay Sakamachi's husband. Um, they met and I believe married in 1972 or four, something like that, um, when Kay was 46 years old. Um, and because I was reading about Bob's work, Bob and Kay's work are intrinsically um, combined. They often collaborated, um, their work is discussed together they founded um, and worked with other people in the Bay Area to found craft guilds together. Um, and so that's when I was first exposed to Kay Sakamachi's work. As a private art dealer, I manage estates. So I don't represent artists that are currently making work. I actually sell artworks that are often made in the past. So I'd like to tell you a little bit of art history and bring you up to um, speed in terms of contemporary art and how textiles and fiber art fit into contemporary fine art and sculpture. About six or seven years ago, I had a real honor to represent a collection by a woman named Sylvia Elsesser, um, who's now passed. And she was an in-law of a very important woman named Truda German Prey. So I'm just curious, but how many people in this room know who Truda German Prey was? Okay, that's pretty great. So um, I did not know at the time. And Truda German Prey, what's really amazing about a show like the Weibei show, um, and what's really amazing when you delve deep into the history of the contemporary craft movement or any selective community of the arts, the interconnections are amazing. And the interconnections are just about friendships. They all knew each other. They hung out. They were friends. That's what it was about. And for the students that are in the room, collect your friends' work. <laughs> Support each other. That's what it's about. So true to German Prey, just a brief history, her parents were teachers. And um, in her archives, this is a life mask that was made out of plaster by a man named Gerhard Marx. And Gerhard Marx, if you know, was one of the founders of the Bauhaus. So as a little girl, the founder of the Bauhaus was like, hey, let me make a mask of you. That's her as a little girl. But then her parents became faculty members at a very important place called Black Mountain College. And Black Mountain College is the seat of all contemporary American fine art. And she had a little brownie camera, a little Kodak camera. She was 14 years old and she was homeschooled, so she had a lot of time on her hands. And she, if you read any book on Black Mountain College, all the photo credits, look at the photo credits, they're important. Because <laughs> that means somebody was there, they were present. Truda was there. All the photos of Robert Rauschenberg, Buckminster Fuller, John Cage, Ruth Asawa, Annie Albers, Joseph Albers, those photos were taken by a 14-year-old girl, Truda German Prey. And she studied under Annie Albers, who was a master weaver. They would vacation and take people from Black Mountain College to Mexico every summer because Albers was a color expert and was inspired by the colors in Mexico. And she ended up becoming the main faculty member at the California College of Arts and Crafts, teaching textiles and weaving. And years later, Kay Sakamachi goes back to school, 
And she had many teachers, Kay had many teachers, but probably, in my opinion, one of the most influential teachers on Kay was Truda Gurnpe. As I've represented many Japanese artists here in the United States, especially second generation artists, so Nisei generation, um, I've always been inspired by how humble and amazing these artists are and how they want to make sure that their teachers are acknowledged. So I think it's really important that we remember that Truda was one of the first people to take weaving from placemats and utilitarian objects to three-dimensional sculptural weavings. And then we start to see Kay doing things like this. I love these pieces. They remind me of sort of tube socks that just sort of dripped and extended all the way from the ceiling down to the floor. But what I really wanted to talk about is I talk to students and I have young people that work in my gallery and they'll talk about going to thrift stores and how cool they are, that they went to Home Depot and make their art out of you know, stuff at the hardware store. Well, Kay did that, like I said, 60 years ago. And in 1963, there was a company, 3M, that invented something called Clear Fishing Line. Nobody had ever seen it before. Now we think of it as just everyday fishing line. But Kay looked at it, and her eyes saw thread, something that could be woven. And what I want you to think about is, for me, artists see the world differently. They see it different than non-artists. They do things with materials that us as non-artists could never do. And it inspires us to think differently and to grow as people. And I think that's what life is all about. And this is what Kay did. That piece is called Kumo, uh, which means cloud in Japanese. And my husband and I are extremely proud to own that piece. Um, it is so inspirational to us. Every single day, it hangs in a skylight, and it changes the way the sun hits it. And what it really is, is it's a line drawing. It, it's a line drawing that changes every second of every day. And it's incredibly, incredibly beautiful. So I don't want to make us go long, so I'm going to speed through this fairly quickly. But um, just to show you, uh, if you can look closely in the middle of this picture, um, right in the middle, um, standing up, is a little K Sekimachi. Um, in 1974, uh, Kay received a National Endowment for the Arts Award to travel to Japan to study traditional ikat dyeing and silk weaving. Um, and upon that trip, she discovered that um, her mother's mother, her grandmother, was in fact a master weaver. And I just think that's an incredible discovery that in fact there might be some DNA happening here. Um, Kay's incredible output throughout her lifetime um, probably hit its stride uh, in the 1980s, in my opinion. Um, but 80s, 90s, 2000s, still going. Um, I was at her house yesterday, and she is still playing, still creating. Um, that's what artists do. They can't stop. It's just part of their DNA. I'm going to flip through a whole series of images really quickly just to show you the diversity of work that Kay has made. Some hanging wall scrolls, an incredible paper sphere 
um, sewn on a sewing machine and folded with traditional origami techniques, molded paper, some of my favorites. Um, Kay calls these twine lines. Um, I call them loopies, I can't help it, I just love them. Um, she calls them twine lines because they're made out of string that's been stiffened and then just tacked to the wall. But again, they just make um, beautiful line drawings. And I can't help but think of a story that on the first day of class, Joseph Albers in his drawing class would take a spool of string and pass it around with a pair of scissors and ask every student to cut a piece of string. And then every student would sit in front of their desk with this piece of string and he would ask them to repeatedly hold up the string and drop it. And however the string fell on the table, they were expected to draw it over and over and over again. They're just beautiful. One of her signature pieces are these leaf bowls. Just the diversity of form and weaving, a variety of materials. Again, one of my favorites. This is sort of a collaboration. She had a longtime friendship with a ceramic artist named Toshiko Takeizu. Um, I had another honor to write her life history for her life, for her last book. And she made these closed pod forms and Kay molded paper around them, made a two-part mold, and then used the Toshiko Takeizu to mold the top part of that piece. Um, again, three-dimensional weaving using box forms. And then to close, this is one of the last pieces that we purchased. It's made out of kiri wood, one of the really important um, woods in Japan. Um, this is wood veneer that was folded into a basket form and then sewn together with thread. And then just with disposable chopsticks, domestic objects used as handles. Um, for our 20th anniversary, my husband and I got married in the backyard of our house. And the house is a perfect cube. And uh, we said no gifts. And as a little surprise, these two little weavings showed up. Um, I really admired them. And a mistake that you can make if you go to a Japanese person's house is to ever say that you admire something. Because these showed up as a wedding gift. And they mean a lot to us. I asked Kay for this talk if there was anything that I could do for her. And of course, as an artist, all she's concerned about is the next thing. She's not concerned about the past or what she did before, but the next thing for Kay is she's having a retrospective at the Fresno Museum of Art, or the Fresno Art Museum. Um, it opens July 13th and it goes through January 6th. Um, I hope that you all make the effort to go there. Um, and if you wanna see that monofilament sculpture, um, we will be lending it for the full length of the exhibition, and I hope you all go. Thank you very much. Timepiece is facing me. I was going to look at my, my watch, but I guess I'll watch the seconds, seconds tick away and hopefully get through uh, the survey of what I'm um, going to show you guys. Um, a brief journey through um, an aspect of uh, what you know, was usually called experimental film uh, history as it relates to uh, the work of Alice Ann Parker. And uh, so I wanted to thank um, Larry and Sherry and Kathy uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here. Um, and this is certainly a very interesting show, actually. I only had a chance to see briefly uh, this morning. Um, so I just, uh, first I, I wanted to uh, read um, <clears throat> What I'd written and which is published, you know, in the brochure for uh, this, uh, well, for my, my feelings about her work, Alice Ann Parker's work. Um, I said, Alice Ann Parker's seven short films made between 1969 and 1974 remain 
revolutionary experiences that explore gender and sexuality with an intimacy, frankness, an eye for detail, a sense of mystery that only a great artist, somebody who's an observer and uh, courageous, uh, can achieve. And uh, <clears throat> so she made films for five years uh, only. Um, but um, those five years and the seven films that Ann Parker made uh, remain distinct and remain uh, as powerful as, I think, as when they were first made and shown, um, which is both a testimony to how they were made, but also what she was singling out, what she was focusing on. Um, Alice Ann Parker, uh, known in earlier years as Ann Severson, um, taught at Rutgers University, the School of Visual Arts, and then UC Berkeley. And beginning in 1966, and then for six years, she was the uh, professor of the humanities at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, and during those years, uh, 1966, when she was at the Art Institute, um, those were years that uh, film, and particularly what was called underground film at that time, was blossoming, uh, was very uh, central stage in terms of the cutting edge arts, so-called cutting edge arts. Um, and she was at the Art Institute uh, at a time when the film program that had been begun by Robert Nelson uh, was just getting underway. In fact, it was about 1966, 67 that Bob Nelson was doing his groundwork um, along with some other uh, filmmakers in, in getting film to be taught there. Uh, and then what developed over the well, several decades from that point on, became one of the signal um, film programs, I think, in the country, if not beyond, uh, that really explored personal uh, possibilities of cinema as a personal art form and, and form of expression. Um, during the 1960s, Alice Ann traveled with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters and was briefly incarcerated in the Bellevue Hospital Psychiatric Ward for the criminal, Criminally Insane. And she quotes, actually, Crazy in Bellevue came first, then Kesey and the Pranksters. Oh, uh, I was charged with grand larceny around the same period, but didn't do time. <clears throat> anyway, it was, uh, she, Alice Ann was, uh, from what I know, I wasn't around then, uh, but certainly everything I've heard and read, uh, she was really one of the central figures in, in really um, embodying the excitement, uh, the openness, the radical energy of the 60s, especially at the Art Institute, which you know really had been really one of the centers of, of well, radical activism of, in the arts and lifestyle, um, and was for many years. Um, so after uh, that period, um, when she finished making films in 1974, um, she studied. Uh, um, Psychic, um, she studied psychic and uh, uh, other forms of metaphysical, um, uh, uh, well, history. And her own abilities as psychic really led her to becoming a psychic, which she still is. And she's considered one of the um, chief psychics in uh, Hawaii. She lives in Hawaula. Um, and she offers residential workshops at her home. So um, one thing about the five, the, the five films in particular that Alice Ann made is that there is an honesty, there is a directness, a sense of objectivity, but ob observation uh, that in each case um, really had a clarity that really I don't think has ever been surpassed, possibly ever been equaled. Um, and what I want to do is con you know, put her work of those years into the context of what had been happening a little while earlier than her own filmmaking and then some of the work that's followed since you know, her own filmmaking and both in terms of how her work has been influential since, but I think just how distinctive it was in relation to what else has, had been be being made. Um, so. What I want to do is begin by chronologically uh, looking at some images from films. Um, these are not great images, but you know the best I could pull from uh, different sources on the internet. 
Um, but what I want to do is do them chronologically, including um, talking about Alice Ann's films um, as they came along, let's say, in the flow of, uh, of the kinds of, of, of work that she, were, she was really uh, focusing on. And, you know, um, I want to just read a couple of things that are very, I uh, looked up in a very strong and I think appropriate and I looked up the definition of graven image. <laughs> graven image, right? Uh, and these are from the, the Bible, or, yeah. And uh, the first says, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of any thing that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Uh, and that's from Exodus. <clears throat> And then uh, another one is, uh, although no single biblical passage contains a complete definition of idolatry, the subject is addressed in numerous passages so that idolatry may be summarized as the worship of idols or images. Um, the worship of polytheistic gods by use of idols or images, the worship of created things, and the use of idols in the worship of God. Uh, this is from um, a study on the Bible. Uh, and the reason I'm bringing these up is because um, cinema came along, you know, as, as certainly the first uh, widespread, you know, public visual medium that was, you know, transferable, obviously, that was uh, able to be shared, uh, you know, uh, universally. It's certainly, you know, uh, since it was a time-based plastic medium. And in the early days, um, in the earliest days actually, one of the first films that was made was The Edison Kiss. Um, and that uh, was a film that was made in, in the mid-1890s and it, it actually scandalized uh, people, you know, at least it was shown publicly in the idea of sharing such a private act, but also something sexual, uh, physical, uh, immediately in terms of the beginning of cinema uh, was something that became um, quite a notorious. And so the reason I'm mentioning Graven Image is because we do have, you know, the world of cinema um, that, among other things, uh, of course, um, we could say certainly idealizes, glamorizes, uh, people, in particular women, uh, but does it, I would say, in a very sanitary way so that it's certainly removed from anything really physical uh, and ultimately very uh, bodily. And so one of the things that Alice Ann Parker focused on in her work uh, was something that cinema could do, and that was to actually reveal and observe uh, the body, mostly the human body, uh, but other living uh, bodies as well, other animals, and ways that they moved with as but in a way that was had pre presented a physicality uh, that until the 1960s pretty much it wasn't either possible and certainly taken seriously as a as something that somebody would do publicly. Uh, for one thing, if one presented the body, uh, the nude body in particular, anything pubic, um, genital, uh, you know, you can go to jail. Um, until the mid-1960s. So by the mid-1960s, late 1960s, when censorship laws relaxed, some artists, and increasingly women, uh, began dealing with the possibilities of showing what otherwise would have been obscene, not seen at all, and in fact thought of as that way, something that shouldn't be seen. Um, again, so um, this whole idea of graven image, this whole idea of something that you don't put of an image up at all, let alone something that is going to cause uh, people to, you know, covet it. You know, and that's an interesting thing to think about in terms of what Hollywood cinema is specialized in. Anyway, so I don't want to go on longer than I'm supposed to. So what I will do, um, actually, is begin a little quick uh, trip through uh, cinema. All right. Um, and what I'll do is speak quickly about uh, these images, where they're from, and uh, just a couple of words 
I think about ways in which uh, they contributed, but also the way they stand distinctly from the films by Alice Ann Parker. Um, so these are gonna be several images from Window Water Baby Moving by Stan Brackage, 1959. And um, I'll just go through them. This is the first of the series. Oops. All right, actually, I wanna go back. Yeah, there's one, there should be one more. Any of it, it's not, it's not essential, but there are three here. Um, this is a birth film. This was a birth film made in 1959, as I say, that was shown widely at its time and for many years uh, to come in the 60s and had a huge influence because for one thing, it depicted the birth of his first child, um, but he did it in a way, it was his film, he did it in a way uh, that on the one hand, presented it graphically and with an intensity and closeness presence, a physical presence that certainly had never been seen before, to my knowledge, in terms of a birth film outside of uh, educational situations, maybe. Uh, but he constructed a complex and you might say romantic, but ultimately something that really uh, was about the physicality of the, of the process, right? But of course, from a man's point of view. Um, and so this is an image of his wife Jane uh, when she's pregnant and the motifs of water uh, and you can see the reflection of window. So it's very poetic uh, and it moves into the more clinical. Uh, we do see a close up here of his wife's vagina and the baby um, beginning to come out of the vagina. Uh, the doctor's hand, uh, you know, beginning to help remove the baby from uh, the womb. Um, and then this is the baby. So I'm showing these three because for one thing they give a sense of his aesthetic, uh, which is very much an aestheticized, even though it does move between the clinical and often what at that time and still might be for audiences shocking uh, close-up depiction of a vagina and of birth. Um, but it also gives you a sense of his visuality, of his particular visuality. All right. Now, I'm moving into a different uh, kind of film. This is Andy Warhol, kind in the sense that it's a very different sensibility. It's 1963. It's actually uh, Warhol's first um, substantial film that he released. It's Kiss. Um, and I'll show you a few images from a series of the film that became Kiss, which was, I forget the number of camera rolls, maybe about 20. Uh, 15 to 20 camera rolls, each about thir three minutes rather, in which one could absorb oneself into, in very slow motion, couples kissing. Uh, mostly heterosexual, but they really varied quite a lot in the course of this one hour long experience. But the object objective clearly was to sort of lose oneself in each of these actions, these uninterrupted uh, three minute sections of people, couples kissing. Oops, sorry, hold on. So we have this, we have that. Uh, one of the things Warhol you know, did in all of his art was series, you know, and a series of multiples of different kinds of ways. And these is, this was a series of rolls of people kissing. Silent, and one basically just, you know, would lose oneself in the physicality as it was presented, but composed of two of, of, of couples kissing. Um, now this is uh, a few years later, this is by Yoko Ono. And this is Bottom, this was one of the Fluxus films. And um, okay, so Warhol, Brackage, among the very powerful male uh, figures who were making experimental film at that time um, and who, um, you know, had tremendous influence. But around 1966, 65, 60, maybe a little earlier, more and more women began to uh, work with film, and making their own films, but it was still pretty rare. And I think by, you know, the accounts of pretty much all the women uh, who, whose work we'll see now, their work was not taken as seriously as the men. Uh, but one of the things that pretty much, I can't say, pretty much all of the ones that I can think of who were making significant work then, they were dealing in one way or another with the physicality, um, the physicality of what cinema could show. Uh, so this is Bottom, and it's, you know, a series of rear ends. 
Um, I'm just going to jump a little in time because uh, a few years later, in 1971, Yoko Ono made Fly. It's another exploration of the body, in this case, a woman's body, uh, nude, and flies, you know, moving around the body uh, uh, in close up, and sometimes the fly is moving into the pubic area, um, or as we see it here. Um, again, somebody, Yoko Ono, who was immediately drawn in her early work, to the pure physicality of what cinema could show um, as, an obser ob as an observing tool. Okay. All right, so in 1966, Gunvor Nelson and Dorothy Wiley, local filmmakers, um, their first film, each of them, made Schmiergunz, and in their own ways, um, very much at that time, learning how to make films um, and actually exploring how uh, women, you know, as sanitized um, and idealized representations in the world, run so counter to physical experience, especially of childbirth. And so among the motifs in this film are women uh, in beauty pageant situations, but also glamorized in different ways on television commercials. And in contrast to the experiences they were having as mothers of this nature, this you know, became the kind of uh, component amongst a number of them of what it was to be pregnant, what it was to give birth, what it was to take care of a household and a baby. Uh, and this was a dramatic and revolutionary film, certainly for its time, and it still is. Very physical experience. Um, and uh, this is from a New York artist from the East Coast, and that's Carolee Schneemann, who around the same time, a little later, 1967, is making a film called Fuses. Again, a, a real exploration, but really a depiction of, in this case, lovemaking, that you know she was uh, experiencing with her lover at the time, James Tenney, composer, uh, who she lived with for a number of years out in uh, north in the Hudson, uh, north of New York, uh, and they lived in a rural situation. And it's a, an amazing film, um, both in the way that the camera is a third, let's say, invisible person, um, but the way that it is both objective but also so powerfully present and intimate in terms of depicting sex between the two of them, but in a different way and with herself as the primary subject, a different way than you would see certainly in pornography, and if one ever encountered it, certainly in that time, um, you know, and certainly contrary to the sexuality or the suggested sexuality in the mainstream cinema. Uh, Carolee Schneemann uh, was one of the filmmakers at that time who was working with film in a very physical way itself, and it became a material that she would work with directly, as you can see evidence of here. So it not only was depicting something very physically present, but it was also, um, she was, in, she was uh, experiencing the, it as image, as, as she was constructing the film in a physical way as well, and she was coloring and doing different things to the material. Uh, another, this is a collage that she did of images from fuses. And this is a film that wasn't seen nearly as much as it should have been at the time. It was, you know, for different reasons. I think that the fact that it was so frontal, that it was so um, clearly from a woman's perspective, uh, that it was so sensual and physical, I think there are other reasons even in addition to that, formal ones, it made it a hard film to actually see, and perhaps even if one was able to see it, appreciate. This is a couple of images of Carolee Schneemann from her very, you know, now famous performance interior scroll in which she removes a text written on a lengthy a piece of paper from her vagina. And I just thought I would show that because, you know, it's another indication, not in film medium, of how both physically but also dealing with herself as a woman and her body, uh, her art, you know, has always been and still is. Uh, regardless of the medium she's working in. So I wanted to start uh, with this group, small group of, you know, kind of prefacing, um, and I'll try to speed it up so you're almost, uh, maybe five minutes. Uh, I want to show a short film uh, now because we're going to turn into Anne 
Alice Ann Parker's work, um, because around now, 1969, is when she made her first film, and uh, that's this one you're going to see a couple of images from, uh, in which she and her husband, Shelby Kennedy, are playfully moving uh, between the clothing that they wear, uh, and they're exchanging each other's clothes. Um, and uh, let's just watch that film now. It's only, this is very short, but it's a marvelous film, and it's her first film uh, that she made with Shelby, and it's just amazingly concentrated and really indicates the series, na the, ser the nature of her work as a, a serial artist, but also her sense of, of uh, observation and objectivity. Okay. Uh, so I'll just quickly say that the film after that, um, this is another still, so just to see again, some of the changes in the film we just saw. Okay, these are two images from River Body, which is on display uh, in the exhibit. Um, and River Body is a, you know, a series of dissolves of nude friends and students um, that she asked to be in it. Oops, sorry, okay, all right. And it's an amazing film, actually. If you haven't seen it, I really you know, recommend you go and, and Take a look at it. Uh, and it's this black and white series of dissolves in which one body becomes another. Uh, but what, among other things going on, is it's a marvelous little compendium of different human forms <laughs> and how different they can be. You know, gender, one is pregnant, Freud of Bartlett. I mean, it's the range of, of people and how distinctive each one you know, is, is remarkable. But also, again, she found a way to depict that. Uh, so that it speaks for itself, and it's uh, like a, let's just say it's a time capsule, but it's also a very permanent appreciation of the human form. Okay, um, so in uh, 1972, Alice Ann turned out, released her most prominent film, and the film that I think is the film that really is the most significant one till today, and that is Near the Big Chakra. And near the big chakra uh, is, you know, uh, as she puts it, an unhurried view of 37 human vaginas, ranging in age from three months to 56 years. And for each of those, it's not the length of what each kiss was with Andy Warhol, but they last for, you know, quite a length of time. Probably, I'm just assuming, maybe a half a minute to a minute on an average. Uh, and these are extreme close-ups. But first, let me say that this is a magazine called um, Spare Rib that was, uh, existed from around 1972 to the early 90s, and she published in the, this issue uh, an appreciation and a description of how she made the film, Near the Big Chakra. And among other things that she talks about is that uh, she saw her daughter nude by a swimming pool, or by having just taken a, uh, a bath, and she was looking at her teenage daughter's vagina, and the, and she got very the daughter got very self conscious, and then she realized that uh, she had not looked at her daughter's vagina since she had been a small child, um, and that she was asking friends, and none of them actually had seen vaginas close up. Um, and she thought, well, let's do something about that. And people told her not to do it. And she thought, well, because people are telling me not to do it, I knew I was going to do it. Um, and so she made Near the Big Chakra. It was produced uh, by an organization uh, that was interested in really exploring and uh, presenting human sexuality in ways that it hadn't happened. It was in the basement of the Glide Memorial Church in San Francisco. Um, and they helped her produce a film which, as I say, for 16, 17 minutes presents different vulva, different vaginas. Um, and it's amazing when you see this film, and I recommend all of you see it. It's, it's quite, uh, a, a, quite an amazing experience because you're looking at a detailed aspect of human anatomy and sexuality, perhaps, but certainly you're seeing an aspect of humanity, we'd, uh, of women's humanity, we never, we never rarely see, and certainly how would we see it unless we go out of our way to, to look, and the camera can do it in a way, of course, that 
in terms of magnifying it, that, that human vision can't do. So this became a celebrated film and a notorious film, and even in its um, premiere was attacked, actually, at the Ann Arbor Film Festival, um, and uh, was trying to be taken off the screen. So I'm just going to, because I am running out of time, yeah, I'm running out of time, I'll, I'll finish it up, and these are images from Valley Export, Man and Woman and Animal, who is, uh, this was Austrian, uh, early 1970s. She's an Austrian artist, and this is a film of herself um, masturbating, actually, and menstruating. Um, and it's really uh, about the image and how we can respond to the image uh, so powerfully of women in this, in, you know, uh, of herself. Um, and it's a powerful film, uh, well, what can I say? Um, and I'll show you a few images from Barbara Hammer, who was a local filmmaker for many, lived here for many years, a prominent lesbian artist. And this is a film called Dyke Tactics, in which uh, she, uh, you know, she has a series of uh, friends and women who are just feeling each other's skin. This is Menses, um, which is a film about menstruation. Um, and finally, Multiple Orgasm. Now, you know, each of these films is very different than Near the Big Chakra, because nothing really had been done and still hasn't been done that quite deals so directly and so intelligently uh, by lining up such a range of women for that purpose. So uh, just this uh, couple of quick things. Martina's Playhouse, which was by Peggy Awish, a film which is very notorious and got you know, me into trouble once because this child is about to take off her panties and for a moment just flashes her vagina and uh, it upsets people a lot because it's thought of as child pornographic, although no, I think that's not the case. And this is the first, or one of the central images, I should say, of a film by Scott Stark. Um, um, and uh, yeah. and that's a film in which he is doing comparisons between the vagina and different other formations like rock formations. And that's a film Speechless from 2008. And I will conclude, okay, with some images by a wonderful filmmaker who's from a Turkey uh, named Nazli Dinsel. Um, and these are just images uh, from different films in which Nazli herself uh, is often the subject, uh, in which she is dealing with her own sexuality. She masturbates um, in one or two of the films. She's dealing with ideas of love and realities of love, and she mixes text with uh, different textural elements. And she lives currently in Milwaukee. Uh, she's a younger filmmaker, very talented, very talented. And the reason I'm showing these, these are images of how she, you know, she works and works physically uh, with the material herself, much in line of the way that uh, Carolee Schneemann. The point being, going back one last time for the moment to Alice Ann Parker, because I think that she was pivotal in the middle section of what I was showing you just now um, in time. And I think she came along at a point where she was synthesizing a lot of the energy of people like Warhol, Brackage, uh, but doing it in a way uh, that I think respected and was approaching her subjects, you know, uh, with I think a candor, but also an objectivity uh, that remains distinctive actually. So, sorry it took so long, thanks. <laughs> I get to do Carlos Villa. If I can find him here. Oh, here he is. And Carlos actually, I think, and just looking at River Body, I think Carlos is in River Body, so you can go see Carlos over there too. Um, just a little side note. Um, I love what Jeffrey said about people all being together, students hanging out together doing things, because Carlos was, was essentially that. He would have loved the Way Bay exhibition. So thank you very much for all of you who organized that, because that is spectacular. It's inclusive on all levels. 
all kinds of work representing everyone over a long history. He probably knew, worked with, taught, learned from, and was a fellow traveler of more of the artists in the Way Bay Show than anybody else. Carlos's way of thinking, his pioneering advocacy of multiculturalism, and his organizational dexterity are also very evident in the breadth and wonderfulness of Way Bay. I'm going to try to squeeze an hour talk. I guess I should do it in like four minutes, but 15 minutes. And my apologies for this being so fast, which is not the very cool Carlos way of doing anything. And it, I thought it would be kaleidoscopic, but Dina managed to cover that earlier with those great images of, that, of those great artists. So that was terrific. Um, I love how we move from Ohlone 19th century art to when the world rushed in into California with the discovery of gold to a trip down Market Street to Carlos Villa's artist feet, which can be seen in the Way Bay Show. A lot of that art time traveling pivots with the life of the life and art of Carlos Villa. Carlos with coffee, blue jeans, denim jacket, and very serious at the California School of Fine Arts, now the San Francisco Art Institute. The major early influence on Carlos was his cousin, Leo Valador, who would make sure Carlos made his way from San Francisco's Tenderloin, where he grew up, to parties at the school in the mid-1950s. Valador's paintings from the 1950s. Uh, Leo's painting, Sunny Side, Sonny Rollins, jazz-inspired painting from 1959. Both those paintings are in the Radar Wenceslund collection in, in Norway. Where, where worlds really do collide, I guess. And then later works by Carlos's cousin in the, that clean minimalist style, but still colors and tonal. And Leo's piece that is here, that's the colors off though. It's a go see the real thing. Um, another fellow traveler and mentor was uh, Wally Hedrick. Uh, one of Wally's paintings, very raw, authentic. Hedrick's work uh, in the Way Bay is uh, one of the things he has is an anti-war, uh, anti-Vietnam War painting, Napalm Sunday, Sunday meaning a dessert. Um, a piece which we have at the Art Institute, which is a tribute banner made by Wally Hedrick to the San Francisco Art Institute's painter, abstract expressionist janitor, Charles Safford, when he left town. Wally being that all-inclusive and blue-collar person that he was that rubbed off with Carlos, too. A close-up of that that shows Wally's poem and how it's signed by artists, many of whom are in this Way Bay show. You know, uh, Leo Valador's on there, Joan Brown, Bob Brown, um, or William Brown. Um, Jay Hedrick signs this, as does Joe Blow, who was uh, Wally. Um, this is, this is uh, lots of those artists managed to get their work purchased by a physician in San Francisco who took it to Norway, and so a lot of it truly is squirreled away in Agsgar, Norway. That's a book about it. This is including Carlos's 1959 painting, which is on exhibit there. It is Scandinavian California coming together. Carlos busy painting in Studio 15 at the California School of Fine Arts. Fellow student Joan Brown. Joan Brown's painting a Studio 15, that same studio. Uh, one of Joan's dog paintings, Howling at the Moon, here in the gallery. You'll, you can see that. Uh, another fellow traveler was Jay DeFeo, known as Jay Hedrick earlier you know, at this time. And Jay's origin from 1956, which is in Way Bay. Bruce Connor in his studio, being reluctant. Um, who approved all of these folk into the Rat Bastard Protective Association, including the youngest member, Carlos Villa, one of Bruce's angels, which is in the show. Um, Jerry Burchard, a fellow student of Carlos's and the photographer for a lot of these artists of uh, San Francisco from this time period. William T. Wiley, another huge influence on Carlos and artists from that time period, from another pivotal per period here at the... Here at the Here's a student at the Art Institute. Wiley's, a piece from Wiley's from the early 60s, Columbus Rerouted, and then Wiley's piece, Rhino Injured, here in the Way Bay Show. A little sense of what that studio life was like. You know, this is Bill Morehouse, um, a key teacher for Carlos on the far right, 
with a folk band with uh, Bill Wiley on guitar and Wally Hedrick on uh, banjo. And their, their assignment on the chalkboard you see is draw what you see, feel, and hear. And, you know, you got to have the guy with the sunglasses. You know? It's Charlie Strong, if anybody knows Charlie Strong. Um, another very influential teacher of Carlos's who doesn't get much uh, notoriety at all or much fame at all is Dor Bothwell, the painter Dor Bothwell. Um, she knew Matisse in the 20s. She traveled to Samoa also in the 1920s, and she would show her Polynesian tattooed legs to the students. And Carlos's nod to the tattooers of the Pacific. Um, Dor Bothwell's painting, or a, I think it's a, a lithograph memory machine from 1947. Bernice Bing, another fellow student of Carlos's, someone who did wonderful paintings and needs much more attention, and maybe the inspiration for Carlos's last project, Rehistoricizing Abstract Expressionism, one of Bernice's paintings from that time period. Bernice was uh, an early, uh, featured in, in an early issue of Art Forum. Wen Ng, a ceramicist, fellow student, and later an entrepreneur in San Francisco who started Taylor and Ng. Fred Martin, who, like Carlos, was always at that epicenter of all things Bay Area art in the last half century, last half of the 20th century. And Fred's painting in Way Bay exhibition, This is the House of Life. Carlos moving his paintings around. Carlos received um, recognition in the first volume of Art Form in September 1962. It's, it, this is a review of an exhibition that Carlos had with Bill Guy, the sculptor Bill Geis. And it's by Walter Hopps. And I love Hopps' last line in this where he says, I mean to praise, not bury the young Via and Geis when I say, however inadequately, their work is impressively ugly and, and rugged. Carlos playing pool, wearing leather pants, this terrific photo series by Jerry Bouchard, and then Carlos, of course, uses it as a promotional poster for one of his shows. Um, this is an excerpt from one of Carlos's resumes, um, and it's the com his community art service section, listing a 1969 presentation he organized during the first Vietnam moratorium day, early evidence of his art activism and influence of people like uh, Wally Hedrick. A key fellow traveler with Carlos was Bill Berkson. Bill and Carlos shared a closet-sized office in the basement of the school and the maintenance tunnel. Both had been at the pulse of that Manhattan art world of the 1960s when Carlos lived there and in many respects traveled in those same circles. Carlos's circle, when he returns from New York City to San Francisco, he is certainly embraced and he, he is certainly embraced and embraces his deep roots in the show that was at the De Young. Carlos was all that, with all that hair, geez. Um, the groundbreaking exhibition, uh, other sources, really an extravaganza of art multiculturalism that Carlos organized at the Art Institute in 1976, embracing all of contemporary artists, all cultures, inclusivity, with installations filled with art and action and sound and key art history paintings, like the first showing of Bob Colescott's Liberty Leading the People. He, sign, he signs it Eugene Delacroix. <laughs> and Colescott's note on his uh, recently finished painting, with the last line being, my orbit clashes with his and the whole thing becomes impossible. And this is another element of Carlos's legacy, this paper trail of things. I mean, this is a great art historical nugget buried within these boxes of great information about this exhibition. Kaisek Wong, the San Franciscan fashionista extraordinaire, was included in other sources, fresh off his collaborations with Salvador Dali and Stephen Arnold. Other sources planted that seed of multiculturalism within an ever more pluralistic art world evidence of the breadth of Carlos's art from the time, his very much overlooked personal performance work. Part of the SFAI painting faculty, Carlos with Bruce McGaw, Franklin Williams and Julia Sotofsky. And Franklin's work is in the way bay just to the left of Carlos's. You know, it's gorgeous, unbelievable. Expressive Carlos doing what he loved, teaching legions of students 
and very comfortable with his real comrades, those painting crew department people. Student Enrique Chagoya, one of it, Enrique's Codex Scrolls is in Way Bay. Student Leone Gaier, also in the gallery. In the 1990s, Carlos put together big chunks of his projects in the book aptly titled Worlds in Collision, published by, published by the school. His collaborator on Worlds in Collision was Reagan Louie, the noted photographer and longtime wonderful faculty member at the Art Institute. And Carlos, always eager to mesh everything together, his life as collage, he made sure there was a course at the school based on Worlds in Collision. This is the course description. Carlos's students from the 80s and 90s included plenty of folk now associated with the Mission School, like Xylor Jane, who also shows up in the, our first presentation by Zena, or by Domdina, I'm sorry. Um, she's represented in the Way Bay. You can see how that art world has dramatically changed, and yet maybe somewhat the same as that Ohlone basket early on, when you look at this and look at that basket. And Carlos is comfortable in all of those worlds wherever he travels. Another one of Carlos's students, shown here in Charles Hobson's artist book studio class, is Barry McGee. And it includes Barry's, this is Barry's page for a scrapbook for the, for the class, it includes Barry's, he calls it his colifong for his book, as opposed to colifong, for his artist book, which was quote, limited to 6,040 million copies signed by anyone who was able to forge my signature. <laughs> Barry with the artists, bookmakers, including Mary Marsh, many of these also Carlos's students. Check out Barry's work in Way Bay. Two more of Carlos's students who are comrades with those Mission Street folk, Alicia McCarthy on the left and Ruby Neri. Don't miss their show that's gonna be happening here. That'll be spectacular. Um, the Gray Gallery in New York City a few years ago did back-to-back -back shows, one on Jess and his circle, which was all these 50s beat era people that Carl's hung around with. And then the next one was Energy That Is All Around, which is all the mission, all the mission school people in San Francisco artists. And Carlos was part of both of those worlds. He crossed all those decades, all those four or five decades of people. And he was very comfortable in walking, navigating that territory. He didn't navigate that territory. He, he was like shoulder to shoulder. Filipino artist Mark Arcega, who teaches at San Francisco State, one of Carlos's students at the Art Institute, shown here in 2012 when they both received Guggenheim Awards the same year. And I love this photo, and I love what it really represents in lots of ways, too, as to the distinction between the Guggenheims that were probably given out in the 50s and 60s and 70s and then what happens after 1976 and other sources. Stephanie Saijuko, another Filipino student of Carlos's, who also received a Guggenheim, who teaches here at Berkeley, and who is on this month's cover of Art in America, April 2018. And an image of Stephanie's studio showing historical imagery to prompt ideas. And I love this because it just looks like Carlos would be doing this. So you'd see that influence. And then an installation by Sajuko. And of course, the artist Jennifer Wofford, who did a splendid job orchestrating the Worlds in Collision Symposium here a couple weeks ago. Who Jennifer is one third of the Filipino American artist trio Mail Order Brides. And Jennifer's MacArthur nurses. Carlos very much at home in the school's courtyard with another cup of coffee. Carlos was a librarian's dream. This note was on his class studio door informing students that they were to meet him in the library. He would warn me that they were going to come up. He was bringing up students and he wanted to see things on collage, you know, collage, you know, and I'd say anything specific, ah, you know, collage. And I said, all right. So I, the first time he did it, I brought up those standard books on collage, you know, titles that were collage. And they said, hey, bring out those artist books. And then he said, bring out those photo books. And then you realize everything was collaged, Carlos. It didn't make any, it wasn't just collage. It was just everything thrown into a big pot and just whatever it was. He would say the library truly was his artist palette. A quote from Carlos, what mattered was the rhythm of making marks, one after another. Rest in peace, Carlos Villa, and his advice and mission for all of us would be, keep it stoked. <laughs> Carlos.
Thank you.